My uh, father, if you uh, remember me mentioning him in the past, Tony, he was not a, a very, uh, thank you, thank you for closing those doors. He was not a very patient man, <clears throat> especially around Christmas time. There was no patience uh, uh, around Christmas time. You have to understand the tradition, French Canadian tradition that I come from, that we come from, Lise and I, uh, in uh, Canada. The tradition in French Canada when we were small, when I grew up, was that the children would go to bed and at the stroke of midnight, the parents would wake them up and they would come and see what Santa, you know, put under the tree. That was the tradition. You'd go to sleep, just barely, and you'd be awakened to the excitement of the tree all lit up and all the gifts under the tree just waiting to be unwrapped. And there was, there was great anticipation because unlike today, the presents were placed under the tree only after the kids were asleep. Only after you went to bed did the parents, you know, or Santa, <laughs> uh, put the, uh, put the uh, gifts uh, under the tree to provide maximum impact when everybody came running into the living room at 12 midnight to the glorious view of the gifts. Uh, there's a picture, guess which one is me? There's me, it's my cousins there, Christmas time. So the gifts are all there, the stockings are full, the goodies on the table to eat. Um, we would open our gifts and we'd also receive visitors. That was another tradition. People at midnight would show up at your house and uh, you know, uh, you'd have a réveillon, uh, you know, a wake up. <laughs> and we would eat at you know, one, two in the morning and continue the, this Christmas celebration uh, into, the, uh, into the early morning. Now, remember I said that my father was not a patient guy. Every Christmas Eve as I lay in my bed pretending to sleep, I could hear him and my mother talking and he was trying to talk my mother into waking me up early. <laughs> let's go, let's get the gifts open, you know? And she said, Tony, she'd say to him, I'd hear, I, I still hear today. She said, Tony, it's only 9.30. <laughs> I mean, let, let's wait until the guests arrive to start the party and then we will wake Michael up. You know, I was an only child, so only one kid to wake up. Uh, we'll wake Michael up and he can come and get his presents. And my, my dad would, you know, give her all kinds of reasons to abort her timetable and tradition. And I'd be in bed saying, go dad, go. <laughs> and then somewhere around 11.30 p.m., you know, she'd relent and when, uh, when he uh, would come running into my room to get me out of bed and we'd dash off to the tree, me ahead of him because he wanted so badly for me to see my gift. You know those people who help you unwrap? <laughs> yeah, he was one of those guys. He hel helped me unwrap. So look at this, and like, wait a minute. Uh, you know, and he'd, he'd handle the gift and try to show me what was what. And I'd be handling and examining one toy and he'd already be grabbing the next box to help me to see what was inside the next box. You know, that was every Christmas, I remember that. Like I said, he was a, an impatient kind of a guy, especially at Christmas. I, I think that, um, I think that uh, Christmas has always been about patience, actually. I, I don't mean the holiday, you know, the Santa Christmas, you know, we're doing Santa Christmas. I don't mean that Christmas. But the reason for Christmas, the birth of Jesus, that was all about patience. After all, the Jews had been waiting patiently for the coming of their Messiah for many centuries by the time that the Christ was actually born. They weren't waiting for a few hours or a few months. They'd waited for centuries for him to arrive and the prophets would come, you know, century after century to encourage them and to tell them that Messiah was coming, don't give up, you know, stay, stay in there, remain faithful. And then when he was born, Luke tells us an interesting story about a man who had learned how to wait patiently for something that took a long time to arrive. So in my lesson this morning, I wanna talk about Jesus' birth, yes, but I also wanna talk about um, 
about a particular reward uh, for a, a man who had learned patiently to wait. In other words, Jesus' birth was a reward to one particular individual. Unfortunately, my dad you know, passed away long ago, but for those of us here, perhaps the story of Simeon can teach us some valuable lessons about waiting patiently, not just for Christmas, not just for presents, but waiting patiently for other important things in our lives as well. A little bit of background uh, passage here in Luke chapter two, verses uh, beginning in verse 25, tells the story of Simeon, and this will you know, give some context uh, as to what I'm trying to explain. So we read, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he, meaning Simeon, he took him into his arms and he blessed God and said, now Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So in this passage, Luke is describing an episode in the very early life of Jesus when, as a little baby, he was brought to the temple in Jerusalem uh, by his parents. Now, the occasion was during the purification rites necessary for Jewish women to perform who had recently given birth. These were laws for Jewish uh, people According to the Jewish law recorded in Leviticus chapter 12 verses one and following, a woman who had given birth to a son was what was called ceremonially unclean because in the giving of birth, there was also some blood involved. And for Jews, whenever there was blood involved, there needed to be a purification rite in order to purify that individual. This meant that Mary was unable to enter the temple for worship while she was considered, quote, impure for seven days or until the circumcision of the child, which was always on the eighth day. And then for 33 more days, she was not allowed to come into the sanctuary. After 40 days, according to the Jewish law, she needed to come to the temple once again and be purified by offering uh, some kind of offering according to the Jewish law. And so according to these commands, Mary and Joseph were both in Jerusalem with Jesus in connection with these purification rites and they also brought the baby Jesus with them. Now, aside from these rites, there was another religious duty necessary that was uh, upon the parents and that is a newborn especially a son, had to be presented to the Lord because the law in Israel was that every firstborn belonged to God. It wasn't yours, it was God's. And so you brought the newborn to the temple and you presented the newborn to God, it was his. And then you would redeem the newborn. You'd give a gift, in other words, to the temple and then take back the newborn. It was a ceremony. Uh, in Exodus uh, 13, one and two that is required. I'll read that for you very quickly. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, sanctify, meaning put aside, sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offering of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast, it belongs to me. So God was taking for himself the firstborn of every family and every beast. As I mentioned, the parents would then buy back or redeem the child with a sacrifice and an offering at the temple. So 
Luke, in his writing, he compacts all of these various rituals into one scene as Mary is at the temple with Joseph, seeing to her purification rites and the presentation of their firstborn to the Lord. All of that's taking place at the same time. It was during this time that they are met by a devout Jew named Simeon. In the passage that we read, Luke describes him in the following way. He says that Simeon was righteous, meaning he was a good man, he was right with God. It says he was devout, meaning he was devoted to God. It says that he was looking for the consolation of Israel. That means he was consciously waiting for the arrival of the Messiah. Now you need to understand, everybody who read the law and the prophets at that time, they knew that God had promised a redeemer. Yeah, sure, is a redeemer coming? Yeah, yeah, we've heard about the redeemer, it's in the law, we've read about it. One of these days is gonna be a redeemer, who knows when it's gonna happen, I don't know, but it's gonna happen, when it, you know, that was the attitude. One of these days, a redeemer's gonna come. But Simeon, he was special because God had revealed to him somehow a dream perhaps or a vision through the Holy Spirit. God had revealed that he would not die before seeing with his own eyes the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah that was promised by God. That was revealed to him. Now, we don't know how long ago this promise was made to him when he was a young man and old man, we don't know that. Uh, all we know is that Simeon had waited patiently for that promise to be fulfilled. And at last, it was, as he was directed towards the baby Jesus. Luke quotes his prophecy concerning the child one that later we know was fulfilled as the gospel of Jesus was eventually preached and received both by the Gentiles and the Jews through Paul and the other apostles. We also learn from this character, Simeon, some valuable lessons about waiting patiently for God's promises. Lessons that can quite easily be applied to our very different lives today. So, Lessons on waiting patiently. Lesson number one, God's promises are not always fulfilled in ways that you would expect. You see, as a Jew living in those times, the last person Simeon expected as the fulfillment of God's promise was this little baby, the first son of these poor people from Nazareth. Now, if it would have been the son of a king, oh yeah, the son of a king, the Messiah, absolutely, you know, let's, let's do it. Or, or, or if it would have been uh, uh, the high priest, the son of the high priest, and God said, okay, he's the Messiah, the son of the high priest, for sure, of course, the Messiah is gonna be an important religious figure, you know, or maybe a military man. A military man who would kind of, you know, rouse the Jews and bring them together and unify them and, and you know, break the yoke of Rome and uh, independence and all that stuff. Absolutely, he, he, he'd buy into that idea as well. <laughs> but God's promise turns out to be a little baby in the arms of a poor young girl from Nazareth. This wasn't exactly the image that the Jews had about their Messiah. And yet, this was the one that God led him to as the fulfillment of his lifelong promise. All of his life he waited for this moment and all of a sudden the, the promise is fulfilled through uh, this tiny little baby. You see, God's ways are not our ways but his ways are perfect, even if they seem strange to us. Sometimes God answers, excuse me, sometimes God's answer is right, and it's right before our eyes, but we don't recognize it because we want it in a package that we want, rather than the way that he presents it. 
Waiting patiently for God's fulfilled promise requires us to accept God's answer, not our answer when it comes. Because what we do is we give God our answer and we ask him to fulfill it. But we're not ready to receive his answer because sometimes his answer doesn't match our request. Waiting patiently, number two. Waiting patiently is an acceptable form of service to God. You know, Simeon did nothing in his life and service to cause or hasten the arrival of, of the Messiah. I mean, he didn't do anything to make Jesus come any faster. And yet God considered him righteous and devout and worthy of a special uh, revelation. The apostles asked Jesus, remember, to enable them to do the works of God. They wanted to do miracles like Jesus, whom they had seen feed the 5,000, and he walked on the water and they said, Jesus, well, we like that. We like that, we want to do that. We're all about walking on the water, feeding the 5,000, raising the dead. Give us that power, show us, show us. And, and, and what, did, what did Jesus do? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. They wanted to do the big things. They wanted to do the flashy things, the powerful things, the things that would draw attention to themselves. And he says, you want to do the work of God? Believe in the one that he sent. That's the work of God. As Christians, the work of God for us to continue believing the one he sent. Why? Because sometimes I'm sick. And sometimes I hurt. And sometimes I've not been treated right. And sometimes it's not fair. And sometimes I've lost the one that I love. And Jesus says, continue believing in the one that I sent. That's the work of God. That's what pleases God Almighty. Sometimes believing and waiting patiently are the only tasks required of us by God. Whether it's waiting for the next step or the next mission or simply waiting for death to take us home like Simeon once the promise was fulfilled. You see, if it's the Lord we are waiting for, then our faithful and patient waiting is fully pleasing and acceptable to God. One more final lesson on waiting patiently. God always keeps his promises, always keeps his promises. Simeon had the promise, but during his wait, there must have been times that he grew tired and restless. I mean, some other people you know, at the temple, they must have pitied poor old Simeon. Who's that guy? Oh, that's Simeon. Whoa, what's he doing here? Oh, he thinks he's going to be seeing the Messiah, you know, and he's, he's waiting. He comes here every day and he prays and he waits, you know. Poor guy. And, 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 and does he have any followers? No, no, he doesn't teach a class. He doesn't do anything. He just, you know, he's just waiting around. And God answered him because all that he had was the promise. That's all he had, the promise. And God answered it unexpectedly one day and made his joy and his life complete. Simeon's experience is like a parable to teach us about our own experience with God's promise to each one of us, that one day he will come. And in the twinkling of an eye, we will all be changed and we will all be with him in heaven rejoicing forever. 
When I say all, I'm referring to all who continue to believe in him as Jesus. Through the rainy days and the sunny days and the good times and the bad times and the good stuff and the bad stuff and the hard stuff and the unfair stuff and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. Through all of those times, I still believe, Lord. I still believe. And that his promise will be fulfilled one day, probably in a way we cannot even imagine now, a way that will catch us off guard. In closing, uh, let me say one last thing about God's promises. They're for everybody. All of you here, you are all Simeon. You're all Simeon, every single one of you, man and woman and young woman and young uh, man and older person, uh, you're all Simeon, every one of you and myself. Whoever you are, where, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, God promises that if you believe and obey his son, Jesus Christ, you too, will receive the promised blessing of eternal life when he comes. If you want the promise for yourself, then I encourage you to give your life to Christ today by repenting of your sins and being baptized in his name. Peter was preaching the gospel on the day of Pentecost. And after he had finished preaching in verse 37, Luke says, now when they, meaning the crowd, when they heard this, you know, that Jesus died and was resurrected. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, meaning they felt guilty because they were the ones that put Jesus on the cross. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? In other words, what, what are we gonna do now? We've killed our own Messiah. How, how do we come back from something like that? Peter said to them, repent, meaning change your mind about sin, change your life, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, if you've been impatient, if you've given up, on the promise and you want to return to him to reclaim your blessings in Christ, then what a day to be restored to him. You will always remember the day that you were either baptized, hey, Christmas Eve day, 2023, or you'll always remember the day you came back. I came back Christmas Eve day, 2023. Either way, the Lord also waits patiently for every sinner to come home to him. I encourage you, if you need to come home to Jesus, to do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.